Hello, hi, good afternoon. I'm really excited about doing this Instagram Live with you today. Um, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Lisa Moscone, who is the best-selling author of this, um, this book called The XX Brain, which has recently come out in the UK. It's been out in the USA for a little while now. Um, I think it's actually just sold out, so but there are more copies coming. And I connected with Lisa a while ago because I'm very interested, obviously, in the brain, and, and I'm really interested in her research. So she is a, an associate professor of neuroscience and neurology and radiology in New York. Um, she's very well established with her career and she has written a huge number of papers on the subject of the female brain. Um, and obviously for, as females we have very different genetic makeup but we also have a different hormone makeup as well compared to men and um, th this is certainly something that I want to explore with Lisa about her research and um, for any of you that have read her book I'm sure you'd agree it has some really interesting um, uh, information and it has some really interesting thought-provoking ideas about the differences between our brains and uh, male brains and also about the whole dementia. We know dementia is incredibly common. As a GP I spent a lot of time going into nursing homes and helping women with dementia and it is a big fear of mine. Obviously none of us want to develop um, dementia so if there are ways that we can um, avoid developing dementia, reduce our risk, keep our brains active, it's really important. There's no point being physically well and mentally um, have problems, especially with dementia. So um, it's going to be really interesting to listen to Lisa's um, pearls of wisdom. I've had a lot of questions already on my Instagram, which is, which is marvellous, and I'm sure there'll be questions coming through. So um, I have my lovely trio of doctors working behind the scenes. Um, so we have, um, I have Dr. Rebecca Lewis, who has just joined Instagram as dr.rebecca.lewis. Um, I've also got Dr. Zoe Hodson and Dr. Sarah Ball, who can answer questions. So if there are questions coming up that we can't answer, then they will type um, and help. So I'm just going to look and see if Lisa's um, requested to join and then I can um, invite her in. So. Let me have a look because there's lots of people commenting already. So she hasn't commented yet to join. So hopefully she's watching this. Ah, oh, she's just requested. So here we go. I just press accept and we'll add her in. just wait for her to join. Here we go. She's connecting. Hi, Lisa. Good morning. Hi, oh, this is really exciting. So I'm pleased it's worked more than anything else. So that's great. <laughs> So thank you so much for um, agreeing to have this session and um, we've already had quite a few questions and um, I know this is going to help so many people. Um, Instagram Live is something that I've only recently been introduced to um, by a colleague, a friend of mine, um, Liz Earle, who is um, really leading the way to help menopausal women um, and she made me come out of my comfort zone to do Instagram Lives but I think they're yeah. good. It's a great way and you know you're so far away and I know you were planning on coming to the UK weren't you um, when your book came out and sadly you've yeah. not been able to so this is you know great that you're doing this. Uh, this is totally this is wonderful and I'm so glad we had a chance to connect and before we actually start can you hear me I can hear you fine yeah okay good yeah okay so, I have headphones in case so great um uh -huh. i've got i don't know if you heard me say i've got sarah zoe and rebecca three doctors i work with who can yes, ask, ask wonderful. Some questions as well so that's going to help some of the people that ask questions so before we get going could you just say a bit about who you are and what you do and um just a bit, a bit about your background to put it in context if that's possible yes of course of course i am i'm a brain scientist i am a neuroscientist by training and i i've been looking at women's brains and men's brains of course for close to 20 years i started yes. when i was 19 which yes. was wonderful in mm. so many ways and i'm i have a dual phd in neuroscience and nuclear medicine so my background. Means you're incredibly be... clever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm a little crazy because <laughs> it was yeah. a lot of studying, but I loved every minute. And actually, for context, my parents are both nuclear physicists. Mm. So I felt like you know, big shoes to fill in some ways, yeah. and I'm not sure I managed, but 
Um, oh, I got that's... to do incredible work and I am now a Wild Cornell Medical in New York yes. City, in Manhattan, the Upper East Side. And I am the founder and director of the Women's Brain Initiative at Wild Cornell, which was a huge accomplishment. I'm just so proud. Yeah, so you should be They would pull that off. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm also Associate Director of the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic, Mm. which I believe is the first and perhaps the only one at this point in the United States. So it's a really great combination because we are doing the research, we're doing all the brain scans, but then we can really see if the research can translate to clinical practice. And as we were talking about the other day, my focus is brain aging dementia anxiety depression is like Mm. neurology psychiatry and we just recently started thinking about menopause yes and so i'm just learning from menopause specialists like you and obgyns and women's health specialists so it's a fantastic time because we're not really working at the intersection if you will between neurology neuroscience brain imaging and women's health, which is, mm, which is a big stretch for me, to be honest. Yeah, no, absolutely brilliant. So, so before we start talking about the menopause, which, as you know, is all I can talk about because that's what I do. <laughs> um, well, that's I what you do. Yeah, I, and and I just wanted to sort of talk about the the differences between men and women. Clearly, there are external differences for a lot of people, but but structurally and genetically, we're very different. And there, it's really interesting that you've called your book the the XX brain because as I'm sure a lot of you are listening know xx is female chromosome and xy is male so there is or there are some people that say well it's because we've got two x chromosomes that we're structurally different and although i do agree with that i would also disagree because we are um made quite differently and also our hormones are very different as well um so, so just tell us a bit about our brains and the difference between healthy male and female brains, if that's okay. Yes, I think you really make a good point. I, I think it's fair to say that we're different and to really just embrace and acknowledge the differences, but with the understand that it doesn't mean that we're better or worse, okay. right? So many people just expect extrapolate from that and then they're like oh you know women can multitask and men get lost all the time the differences that we are looking at are subtle to start with but they can be very impactful so it's not structure or anatomy as much as function that really differs between men men's brains and women's brains and like you were saying this is in big part due to the fact that we have different hormones and different hormonal receptors Mm -hmm. in their brains and that's really from the moment of conception Mm -hmm. so at the very first when the baby is born and the the fetus we already have these different chromosomes that dictate in part protein synthesis right Mm -hmm. so baby girls have xx chromosomes and baby boys have xy's and even then at the genetic level there's immediately a difference because the X chromosomes contains 1,098 genes, whereas the Y chromosome is much tinier and only contains 78 genes. So from the moment we're born, we have 1,000 genes more than men, which is not a huge amount of genes, but it's, it's sizable. It's still there, yeah. Right, and the thing is that these genes are involved not just in reproductive function, but also in brain health and brain function. So we differ just slightly right away. And that then dictates different patterns of brain development in that women make more of certain neurotransmitters like dopamine, whereas um, XY babies make more uh, serotonin, for example, which is a feel-good neurotransmitter. But I think what's really important for future development is that hormones work like keys in a lock. Just we're always talking about hormones, we never talk about hormonal receptors. Mm. The hormones need to bind to a lock or the receptor in order for things to happen. Mm. And women's brains have 10 times more estrogen receptors than men's brains. And men's brains have 10 times or more testosterone or androgen receptors than women's brains. So the functionality is different. Mm. The functions of the hormones are similar. 
estrogen and testosterone are both energizing hormones in the brain. Mm -hmm. So you really want to have a lot of those hormones and we should all come to you to make sure we never lose them. But it's, but it's so interesting, isn't it? Because um, certainly, as you know, a lot of the work I'm doing is trying to almost redefine the menopause. So it's not just thought of as um, a transition period where we experience symptoms, but actually a long-term female hormone deficiency. And yes. a lot of people don't think about hormones as um, a substance that gets all around our body and affects so many cells. You know, if you talk to people, they'll say, well, a lack of estrogen will cause sweats and flushes and it will stop our periods. So then they're thinking of the reproductive system. Um, if you say to many people, do we have hormone receptors in our brains? Well, they would say, well, why? Why would you need them in our brains? Um, yeah. And it's really important when um, I'm sort of educating doctors, nurses, pharmacists, women and men as well about mm -hmm. hormones and the menopause, it's really important to start with the basics and think about what estrogen does in our whole body and what testosterone does because as you know women have testosterone too and men yeah. have estrogen too just different amounts and different ratios right. and um so if we think about changes that happen in our bodies and the difference between females and males there are quite a lot of diseases that are different in men and women there's lots more autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and, um, and celiac disease diabetes in women compared to men but then there are brain diseases, which you very eloquently talk about in the book, that differ yeah. between men and women, aren't there? Yeah, and that's really what led me to look at women's brains as being different from men's brains. Because so I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease oh, no. that really hits the women in my family pretty hard. And we were talking about, it, about this the other day. And my grandmother was one of four siblings three sisters and one brother and all three sisters developed alzheimer's disease around the same age and died of it which was horrendous because it was like a 10 years 12 years 15 years span of just going nuts we i'm from florence in italy and there, there are no social services there mm -hmm. at least when my grandmother was sick like she lived in the house with us until like the very last minute and my mom was the primary caregiver and it was just a disaster. But the brother did not. So all three sisters developed Alzheimer's and died of it. The brother was spared, even though they lived to the same age. And this is just one of the many conditions that affect women more than men as far as their brains are concerned. Women are also twice as likely as men to, have, to be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or depression. We're three times more likely or even more than that, to develop an autoimmune disorder, including those that attack the brain, like multiple sclerosis. We're four times more likely to have headaches and migraines. I have one right now. I have constant migraines and I, I begged for hormones, but they said in, in my case, hormones might make it worse. And actually, I wanted to ask you about that. We're also more likely to uh, develop meningiomas, the most common form of brain tumor, especially after menopause. Mm -hmm. And we're also more likely to die of a stroke should a stroke yes. take place. Yeah. So it's that's, great again, after woman, menopause. Yeah. yeah, and the, the thing that I think has been overlooked in neurology and psychiatry is how all these different risks really have a common denominator, which is the menopause. Absolutely. Menopause makes everything worse. And we, yeah. we're just not... We're not used to thinking about it, to even talk about it. I never studied menopause right. in school. I had no, 20 well, I didn't. years... I had you know, Before I my education. No, I had no training at all. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a physician, so I'm not an obs and gynae um, specialist. I, I'm a, a hospital doctor, and then I went into to family uh, medicine. So, um, but I'm very into disease prevention. And, you know, it's very important that we, we will talk about, you know, food and nutrition and exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really, really key. But we can't replace these hormones once they go and in the Victorian times it didn't matter quite so much because women used to die quite soon after their menopause the average age of death was a couple of years after the natural menopause whereas now thankfully we're, we're physically better we're living longer the average age in the UK of death for women is about 82 so that means about three decades of living potentially without hormones so these this great lock and key analogy you said these four cells are not being stimulated by estrogen um, they can sometimes be affected by some phytoestrogens in the diet but not to the same extent that they were 
when we were having periods. And um, certainly when I was at medical school in the 80s, we were taught, well, women are more likely to get dementia because they're older, they live longer. Well, how wrong is that? I'm sure you Oh my God, that's been, that's the story of my career. Yeah. I literally, as soon as I started asking, because, because of my grandma, I'm again starting my PhD and I, I was looking at brains already um, during university. And then I asked my supervisor, does it matter? I mean, is it just my family? Am I screwed? <laughs> or is this something that all women should know about? And they were like, no, no. They were very much like, you know, sweetheart. <laughs> the <laughs> point is that women live longer than men. And Alzheimer's disease is a disease of old age. Mm. So, of course, more women than men have Alzheimer's disease. And honestly, if you believe that, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, but the point is, Number one, women don't live that much longer than men to start with, right? Yeah. So here in the U.S., the difference is four and a half years. And I was just reading that in England, it's three years. And there's this wonderful study that's done in England showing how this longevity gap is actually narrowing. Mm. And by 2030, I think, that there's going to be no difference anymore in the U.K., mm. which was that, well, but still, yeah. Alzheimer's and dementia is the number one cause of death for women in the UK, even though there's no difference in longevity or lifespan. So there has to be something more. And then we went on, and that's been my entire professional career, really, uh, to, to show how Alzheimer's disease is actually not a disease of old age, but rather it starts in the brain years, if not decades, prior to clinical symptoms, right? So it's not like all of a sudden you have a cold, boom, you have Alzheimer's. Yeah, exactly. It takes many years for all these brain changes mm -hmm. to really impact your brain to such a, an extent or such a degree, then then yeah. the, the symptoms come up. Yeah, which is so then, really, yeah, go on. And then you put the two and two together, which is like detective work in a way, and you're like, okay, my question has changed, right? So if it's not, the difference in longevity and if Alzheimer's disease starts in midlife, what happens to women and not to men in midlife that could potentially impact their brains and kickstart Alzheimer's disease? And that's how we stumbled on menopause, which was honestly unexpected to me. Yeah. I, was not, I was not looking at menopause. It just happened to be the number one predictor for brain aging and Alzheimer's risk in women which was and, like, and whoa. It, it, is, it is very interesting when you look at um, women who have an early menopause. So um, as you know, around one in 100 women under the age of 40 have an early menopause. And this can be a natural thing or it can be because their ovaries are removed for certain reasons. And we know that these women have a far greater risk of developing not just dementia, but heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, um, yeah. because they have longer without their hormone. So again, it, it does make sense. Um, so, but tell us, how does estrogen work? Just explain how estrogen helps the brain. What does it do? So in neuroscience, we refer to estrogen as the master regulator of the female brain because estrogen is a hormone of many hats. And we, we say estrogen, and you're very sweet to let me do that, um, because it's the most well studied, but in reality, I'm thinking estradiol. Mm. And then of course, there are other forms of estrogen. Progesterone is super important. Like it's, it's the whole hormonal combination, right, that matters most. Mm. That said, the research has really looked at estradiol, so 17 beta estradiol. Mm because um, the vast majority of receptors in the brain are for that specific hormone. And what we have shown, what many studies have shown is that um, estrogen is really so important for so many different functions. So first and foremost, for energy activity in the brain. Mm -hmm. At the cellular levels, within the neurons and the glial cells and astrocytes, um, estrogen literally pushes your brain cells to burn more glucose and glucose is the main fuel for the brain that generates ATP. So really, estrogen is so important because it keeps our brain stimulated. It really keeps our neurons firing. It keeps them active. Also, it's really important for plasticity, which is the growth of new cells, but also the plasticity of whatever cells you have in the, the little dendrites. You know, they need to branch out and just make connections with different yeah. neurons. So neuroplasticity is really important. 
and also immunity. Mm. There are so many studies completely overlooked in many ways. Showing, yeah. Right? Yeah, mm. showing that estrogen is just so important to activate the immune system mm. as well as all the other systems. So there are many different things that estrogen is needed for. Mm. And one of the important things is that testosterone has similar functions, mm. right? But in men, testosterone declines pretty gradually yeah. over time. And very often men are fertile in old age, like Mick Jagger is dead again for the 15 times. Whereas women's estrogens really go away due to menopause, which could be fairly quick as a process. Yeah. It could take years, but yeah. it's still quite abrupt. I mean, you're, you're in midlife and all of a sudden your most potent estrogen is gone. Yeah, which, and like you were saying, for some women it can happen overnight if you're getting a nephrectomy or a, or a hysterectomy or for some women because of cancer treatment, Absolutely. for example. Yeah. And that's a shock. Yeah. You know, it's your entire body, including your brain, that just goes mm -hmm. into a sudden deprivation state. Mm -hmm. And a lot of different things happen that require adjusting and support. Which is yeah. the whole point of the book is not just to alarm people, it's to say there are many things that we can do yes. to yes. really help Absolutely. our brains. Yes. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize a lot of women um, and men don't understand what the menopause is, they don't, they're not expecting yes. symptoms. And I know when I was having some symptoms, I think I explained to you for a few months, I um, was working very hard to develop my website and I was um, really keen to open a clinic but I couldn't remember very simple things. I'm, I'm, I'm quite scatty because I'm quite busy. So I'd often lose my car keys, but then I found the ones in the fridge. Like what the <laughs> hell, I'd never put them away in the fridge before. I, I found it really difficult to remember um, just names of people that I know very well. I couldn't remember dates. I even prescriptions, you know, antibiotics, um, drugs that I've been prescribing for 20 years. I couldn't remember their name. I couldn't remember their dose. But I also became very emotionally labile, very anxious, very, also very flat, just no motivation, didn't want to do anything, just feeling really, really low. And then at other times, very angry and argumentative and hating my brother, my husband's breathing, everything about him was just annoying, which is funny when I look back, but actually it's quite scary because, you know, I adore my husband, we've been together 31 years and... I, he could have just walked out and I would have said, great, I've had enough of you. And it's like this, your brain has been taken over by someone else. And I wasn't prepared for it at all. And I blamed it because I was tired. I was getting back to back migraines, which I again thought oh, I was just working too hard. And obviously, I'm very open. I take HRT. Once I realized it was my perimenopause, I replaced with um, 17 beta of estradiol, body identical um, estrogen and natural progesterone. And it was quite startling to get my brain function again. And then I have added in testosterone, which has really helped with my, my memory, my concentration, my sleep. Um, it, it's amazing, but obviously that's a trial, one of one, that's useless, isn't it? But I, we see it in my clinic time and time again. And women, right. um, someone said to me yesterday, she was trying to describe a banana to her children and she forgot the word. So she's saying that long yellow curved thing that you eat. <laughs> and her children were going, what on earth? It's banana. And she knew straight away <laughs> she said the word. But although it's funny, it's also really sad because we see so many women who really worry they've got dementia. And a lot of them have gone to dementia clinics. They've gone and had testing their memory isn't great, they've given up work because they're writing lists, they can't remember, and they can't remember sometimes, the people say they can't remember where they park their car, they can't remember the names of people they work with. They, one lady told me she's a secretary and she could almost hear younger people laughing at her as she's trying to log on and remember her password every day. And you can understand, especially if they've got a family history of dementia, Yes. They would think, well, this is like me. This is this is how I'm going to end. And it's very, very scary. Yet we know, as I explained to you, when we give these women the right dose and type of HRT, as well as lifestyle advice, they often find that, wow, it's like this cloud's lifted. Their brain has started to work. And you can almost yeah. hear these cogs working again in your brain. It's quite something. Um, oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. and... The you know, I always feel like if men had hot flashes, 
Oh we would know what to do, right? That would be a national priority and all funding agencies Absolutely. would have been working on this for centuries. For yeah. women, it's like, oh, really? You have hot flashes? Oh, I yeah. haven't slept in my poo you. Yeah. And that's the end of it. Like, deal with it and make it work. And I, mm -hmm. I think it's just not fair. And there's so little education around menopause. Right, yeah. so many women don't even know what menopause is until no, it happens also, to them. And a lot of women see it as a natural process we go through, which is absolutely correct. Which is correct. But they don't see it as a, a, a process which there's an increased risk of future conditions, which are more significant as we're living longer. Right. Um, and I think this is what's really key, um, is about trying to educate ourselves almost while we're young and we can make these changes and i know sure. certainly in your book you're very um it's lovely how you've written so much about diet and about exercise and about sleep and things that we should be doing from quite early because then it's good um practice because i know myself when i had symptoms i couldn't be bothered to do anything but my diet was actually very good my nutrition was good so actually, if it went slightly bad, it wasn't terrible. But if it was really bad and then got worse, which it often does happen for people and last for years, then that's a real problem, isn't it? So, you know, a lot of the foods you talk about, so that it would be useful maybe just to go through some of the um, difference between fats, because there's a real confusion, isn't there, that people think all fat is bad. So lots of people cut out all fat from their diet, which is... You know, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that you're saying that because here in the U.S., people think that all fat is good. Right, interesting. Yes. <laughs> it's been like a couple of years where everyone is going to in, on ketogenic diets, or keto diets, yes, or very high diets. coming a little bit, the ketogenic diets are coming in a Oh, my bit. goodness. It's incredible. And then because they can eat all these animal products, what happens is that a diet... It's a diet that, that can be very low in fiber. Mm. And we know that fiber has regulating effect on sex yes. hormone binding globulin, which is that substance that regulates estrogen and testosterone mm. flows throughout the body. Mm. So diets that are high in fiber are usually associated with better hormonal health. Whereas diets that are low in fiber has the opposite effect. Yes. And I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> So in England, you have the opposite effect. All fat is bad. Um, I think it's really important to talk about the quality yes, of the fat, right? Yeah. So there are different types of fat, and they have different functionalities and different yes. properties in the body and the brain. Now, one thing that I often mention is that, at least in the United States, one of the arguments being made in favor of a high-fat diet is that the brain is made of fat. And you have to eat all this fat in order to make sure that your brain has enough. And I always say, well, yes and no. It depends on the kind of fat, right? So we want to distinguish between um, four different types of fat. Mm. There's monounsaturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, saturated fat, and transunsaturated fat, the trans fat. And cholesterol, so five. There's also yeah. cholesterol. And everybody's like, oh, I need to have a lot of cholesterol in my diet because my brain contains a lot of mm. cholesterol. No, that is not correct. The brain does not use any of the cholesterol in the diet. In fact, that cholesterol cannot even get inside the brain because there are no um, passageways for that specific yeah. kind of fat to enter the brain. The brain makes its own cholesterol from the moment we're born and it's completely shielded away from the rest of the cholesterol yes. in the body. So yeah. you don't need to eat cholesterol to support your brain. However, you do need to have cholesterol in your diet to support your hormones, right? Absolutely. So it's a yes. good balance. Mm. Mm -hmm. Saturated fat is similar in that it can always get inside the brain, but the brain does not request it after adolescence. So saturated fat for brain development is most important for kids and adolescents. But mm -hmm. after that, after you're 21, 22, your brain just doesn't take it up from the blood. So it just stays in your circulation and doesn't necessarily benefit your brain. And this is really uh, biochemistry 101, neurochemistry 101. I got so much hate on Twitter for saying that, but it's true. You just grab a book of biochemistry and, and that's just reality, right? So the one, the 
best type of fat for your brain is polyunsaturated fat of PUFA. And we always talk about omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Yeah. Those are the fats that your brain really wants and needs, especially one type of omega-3 that is called DHA. Yes. And is found predominantly in fish, seafood, mm. but also um, you can get it also indirectly from vegetarian sources of omega-3. It is called ALA. The only thing to keep in mind, and I know that there are many vegans and vegetarians in England, right? Yeah. Right, I'm among those. So one thing to keep in mind is that ALA needs to be converted to DHA in the brain. And up to 70, 75% is lost in the conversion. So we need to have, if you need two grams of DHA per day, which is what your brain usually likes, mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to eat at least eight grams of ALA because 75% yeah. it just doesn't make it, or it's, it's lost. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's yeah. really important because certainly, I mean, I'm sure, it, well, I know it's the same in the USA. There's a huge amount of supplements in the UK and the USA, and certainly at the moment, there's um, to have menopausal supplements because it's a big marketing ploy, and it really scares me um, what some of these supplements contain. So, for, the, for those of you who are listening, it's really important to look at the actual ingredients and what they are. And like you say, omega three, there's different types, so it's it's really key to know the source. And if it's a fish oil, it's useful to know what fish it is. Is there any mercury? Um, you know it, it, it's contained it's 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 a big industry so you have to be very careful if you're taking supplements um but you talk a lot about other foods so antioxidants as well um a lot of people don't really yes. know what antioxidants are so can you explain what they are or what they do to our brains sure so the brain is the most metabolically active organ in the body and it burns glucose as the primary source of fuel Every time you burn glucose because of oxidation, free radicals are formed. Free radicals are bad for your body and brain. I mean, they're, they're a natural byproduct. You just don't want to have too many. But overall, the effect is like almost like a rusty effect. So it makes free radicals and oxidative stress uh, make your cells and your brain cells age faster and less efficiently. So it's really important to have antioxidants in the diet because the antioxidants balance out the free radicals. They're like policemen <laughs> that enter your brain, find the bad guys and just kind of kick them yes. out. So it's really important to have them in the diet. Another thing that we found was, so we do brain scans and we look at brain mm -hmm. scans of women who are perimenopausal and postmenopausal mm -hmm. and how they transition. Right? Mm -hmm. The one thing that we have found and published a number of times is that there's an overall reduction in brain energy levels mm -hmm. due to menopause that then uh, is really the reason the women suffer or develop hot flashes, night sweats, anxiety, depression, brain fog, mm -hmm. um, you know, even memory lapses. It's because it's just really strongly correlated with this energy drop in women's brains. And one of the best ways to restore energy levels is to take antioxidants, especially in women, which we published in the British Medical yes. <laughs> Journal, the Open Access version. There's a strong correlation between the amount of antioxidants in your diet and energy levels inside a woman's brain. So just to be a little bit more practical, the most important antioxidants are vitamin A or beta carotene, which is the precursor, mm -hmm. vitamin C and vitamin E. Mm -hmm. There may be more, but these are the ones that have been shown over and over again to really be helpful. Yeah. And you have to start somewhere, so you may Absolutely. as well start and with think, something you know, that's been proven just, to work. I'm thinking about our diets are so important aren't they and our nutrition and, and you do talk about eating the rainbow which is which is absolutely key and I talk to my children all the time about having different colors and I don't eat meat and I eat a lot of vegetables uh, but there are a lot of vegetables I eat that they hate so I hide them and in the way that I cook casseroles and various things so they don't realize what they're getting but it's so important isn't it because it's very easy to reach for processed foods for ready-made foods um and um you know to have fresh food or frozen food like sweet corn that's been frozen mm -hmm. at source is so important isn't it for not just our brain health but our cardiovascular health our energy sure. our everything else but certainly for our brains and i think 
you know, I grew up, my grandfather always say, oh, you've got to eat well because it will fuel your brain. Your brain uses lots of energy. And I was thinking, what the hell? How can it use? It's not, it's not doing anything. You know, my muscles are doing the work. But it's so true, isn't it? It's really important. And it's um, when we think about heart disease and cardiovascular disease, like you say, di dementia is a very common cause of death, but also cardiovascular disease. And oh, sure. there's a different type of dementia, isn't there? Multi-implant dementia where people get... Um, like furring of the lining of the arteries that feed the brain as well so they get these almost mini strokes that cause dementia and cognitive decline and we know that having a healthy diet can help these blood vessels to keep open and reduce the atheroma and the fatty deposits so they so it's not just the brain cells but it's the the blood supply to the brain that's really important isn't it incredibly so yes and it so one of the questions that are so um, on your feed is uh, you say that brain energy levels go down but cognition is preserved which is true and I actually I meant to uh, say that before because I don't want anyone to panic when I mention these brain changes what we have found and many people confirm is that cognitive performance is not substantially impacted due to menopause like you feel like you're not performing well mm -hmm. but you still perform just as well as a man of your same age and as a woman also of your same age of menopausal status. And the reason for that is under investigation. And we're actually trying right now to find out uh, what kind of compensatory mechanisms are in place that preserve cognitive health in women mm -hmm. in long age, um, in old age. We also know that women perform better than men to start with. Especially, especially oh. verbal memories. <laughs> big news, big news for women, yeah. scientists. But uh, it's true. So we, we perform a little bit better to start with. So it's even harder to measure a decline, which is a double-edged sword, you know, because if you're concerned about your risk of Alzheimer's and you go to an Alzheimer's specialist, they do these tests that are mostly verbal memory, associative memory, logical memory, and you have an advantage over your normative values to start with. So the good news is that we're still performing as well as anybody else at age. The bad news is that if you have a problem and you don't get a brain scan, it's really hard to catch the problem early, yes. which yes. is another reason that perhaps women are just not diagnosed early enough yeah. But all of a sudden, they get this diagnosis of dementia that is really frightening, and there was no warning. So I'm a bit, I'm obviously a bit advocate of using brain scans I mean, it's very for early diagnosis. Yeah, and, but certainly um, in the in the UK, it, having a diagnosis and there, there's no really really good um, treatment. So for a lot of people, um, it. it the, treat, the diagnosis can be delayed because it doesn't really change what they what they're going to um, what the treatments going to be, and for a lot of people, men and women, it's very scary having this label almost of dementia, and it's very hard because, like you say, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like a heart attack that you know you can be fine and then you have this central crushing pain and you're diagnosed um, and it can be very difficult sometimes to access scans certainly in the UK not everyone can get a scan very easily and then even it's not the, necessarily the right type of scan so they might you know um, there's very few dementia specialists in the UK and that can be very difficult um, and then it's also knowing what you can do and for a lot of people they think well the diagnosis is almost the nail in the coffin that means I'm going to end up in a vegetative state in a nursing home and but actually there are ways that we can reverse some of these changes and um, sometimes it's a combination of treatments isn't it including lifestyle yes. and I think you're very clear in the book that it's never too late to change how right. you are and I think I guess for me as a physician sometimes I worry that if people have the diagnosis too early they'll almost sort of give up and that's wrong yeah. you know if we, we need to know that there's a and dementia is a is a quite a cruel word isn't it because you know there's different people with dementia and some are functioning much better and some sadly are really not functioning very right. well at all and so it's a bit like if you were saying parkinson's disease there's a lot of people that are very fit 
physically active and mobile and sadly some that are in wheelchairs so I think dementia can can really frighten a lot of people um, right. but like the cognitive decline or the reduced brain function if there's ways we can reverse it earlier or even prevent it would be amazing right. isn't it? yes um, I think that's what we're really aiming for right to really understand yeah. risks yeah. and address them as soon as possible and again it's never too late it's just that the longer you wait the more effort you have to put into it because um, so we obviously follow a mix of therapeuticals plus mm. lifestyle interventions mm -hmm. because they have to go hand in hand you know like if you have diabetes and you take metformin you can't you can't just have pizza all day long you have Absolutely. to adjust your diet so that the medication stands a chance and this, the same happens for Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's prevention. Your, your lifestyle needs to be conducive yeah. to brain health. And then we can talk about other things that one can do as well. And I think for women, looking at HRT, hormonal replacement therapy, is very important. And we need to do it better as for us as far as mm -hmm. Alzheimer's and dementia is concerned. And I think that brain scans are going to be incredibly important to really understand the interactions between the hormones and the Alzheimer's pathology, which are two different things. But I think it's undeniable that your lifestyle plays a big role in the way you know you age, yeah. and especially your lifestyle, your health levels, and your overall health in midlife mm -hmm. is the strongest predictor of your health in old age. So and that's midlife. really key, isn't it? Say that once again, because that's really yes. important. Right. The, your health in midlife is the strongest predictor of your health for the, for the rest of your life mm -hmm. and in old age. So I think the midlife is really the turning point in women's brains mm -hmm. where you need to put an effort. You have to think about your brain as your best friend yes. and feel like you do have the power to support your brain. Because so many, so many people, so many of us are like, well, I don't know if all the things I'm doing actually make a difference for my brain. And the answer is yes, they do, right? They, they really do. There is science, there is research that shows, for example, there's this wonderful study from the UK showing that um, if your diet is rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids, like in fish and legumes, then that's really associated with the later onset of menopause in women. Whereas women whose diets are very rich in refined grains and sugar and candy, they look specifically like candy, um, they have a much earlier onset of menopause. So there's clearly an association between what we eat and what happens to our hormones, which honestly is no surprise. Yeah, <laughs> I no, think, right? Absolutely. Your yeah. PMS, you go for chocolate, there's a reason. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Looking at the, the bigger picture, but certainly, you know, all the tips in your book about helping your brain are also about helping your body as well. And I don't think yes. there's anything that you could read there that you can't start early enough. You know, I think um, clearly there are some people who genetically maybe because of their family history or if they have got a predisposing condition are, are going to develop dementia we can't eradicate it but if we can reduce the severity and delay the diagnosis by lifestyle changes but but thinking about them early is is really to really key isn't it although you're saying um yeah although although we're saying so the advice which book this book yes the X -X. Right. Yeah. Um, With Louise's beautiful <laughs> quote on the cover. There it is. Um, but it's really important that we try and embrace and think about things that we might not necessarily notice a difference early. You know, yes. I look at some of my um, some people I know or, or some of my children and, and 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 what they eat sometimes. I think, oh my goodness, but they're fine. But actually, if they carried on eating rubbish, it, it's going to carry on, isn't it? And get worse as we get older. Yeah. We can't get away with things the same. But we want to install good diets and good routines and good yes. um, health. Because otherwise, I think when we're, especially when we're menopausal, we feel very guilty anyway. And we're torn in lots of directions. If we're feeling 
low and um, confused and we've got low self-esteem, we're not going to suddenly then launch into a great new nutrition plan and exercise plan. But if yeah. we've got that habit going already, that's going to make quite a difference, isn't it? So, right. Um, and I think it's really about consistency. Like yes. here in the States, there are so many people who just go on crash diets or yes. Yes. any diet for like three weeks. And then that's it. The diet is gone and they go back to fries and burgers. And yeah. I think it's about a lifestyle that is sustainable mm. and also pleasant over time because you want to be happy in your life, right? If, if you can't eat this, you don't eat that. The, some celebrities told you that they only drink celery juice and that's all they're doing. It's just not sustainable sometimes, right? So it's really important to... To look for a combination of things and you mentioned exercise and i think exercise and stress are yeah. two stress reduction are two huge preventative measures that anyone can really implement in their lifestyles in their lives at any time and that are often very much overlooked when it comes to women's health mm. right so for context exercise um, there's one beautiful study among many others where hundreds of women followed for over 40 years and they've really looked at their fitness levels and they found the women who are more physically fit or more active, physically active in midlife have a 30% lower risk of dementia later in life as compared to women who are sedentary. 30%. If I had a drug the lowest your risk of dementia, my risk of dementia by 30%, I would be rich. Yeah. Everybody would buy. It would be FDA approved tomorrow. It would be such a success. And instead, the prescription is literally move your body. It's free. It costs you nothing. You need to make the time and do it consistently, especially during perimenopause and after menopause because... You know, your estrogens are not there to help you burn that sugar <laughs> in the muscles, right? Well, of course, unless so. you take unless you take HRT, which uh, right, you know, so we know has very helpful benefits well. than, than risks, and and it's very difficult sometimes because, um, as you know, there's there's really not enough research that's done in women, let alone menopausal women, and it, it we it's very hard to know is it replacing the hormones that has the direct effect on the brain, or is it because women just feel better so they can exercise more they can eat better they can sleep better they have less I stress. Say maybe both, um, right? you know and it's probably a combination you know a lot of women tell me that they they have no enjoyment in life that their um zest for life has gone they stop reading books because they can't concentrate they've stopped doing crosswords mm -hmm. because they can't remember anything and um and so then suddenly they start doing hrt and they feel better they're more motivated um, and also their, their brain's working. So then, then they're doing crosswords, they're reading books, they're watching television, they're listening to the radio. So they're stimulating their brains. Which right. obviously, it's not just the pure hormone, it's the whole package, if you like, because For sure. it's easier then yeah. to function. I think it's, a, it's always like a combination of things. And it doesn't matter which one comes first, right? I think no. if you're in better physical shape, then maybe HRT would work better for you and help yeah. you get Absolutely. even a higher so, level so much yeah. and um and just before we finish i wanted to just talk a little bit about sleep because yeah. um sleep obviously is very important a lot of us don't quite get enough but actually it's not just the length of sleep it's the quality of sleep isn't it yes. that's really important and just explain why our brain needs sleep it seems to me a waste of time i could get so much achieved if i didn't sleep but <laughs> we need it right I mean... so <laughs> I'm Italian and sleep is sacred for me. Mm -hmm. I moved, you know, I came to the to the United States to New York in particular, and everybody just so proud of not sleeping. Yeah. I've been working twenty hours and I'm still going. I'm like, you're nuts. I need my sleep. So sleep is really important for the brain because it's literally the only chance that the brain has to stop supervising the rest of you mm -hmm. and takes care of itself. And that happens especially during one phase of sleep. We have five different sleep phases. And there's one phase right before dreaming that's called a slow wave sleep or deep sleep where the body is completely still. It's not moving at all. So the brain just needs to operate minimal supervision on breathing and heart rate and just bodily function. 
it can really turn into itself and start cleaning itself out. There's a whole system that just basically gets activated during that phase of sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's like a dishwasher for the brain. It's like the brain is giving itself a shower and all the cerebrospinal fluid is moving and all the toxins are removed, all the impurities are removed, all the cytokines with the inflammatory markers are removed. Mm. So that specific phase of sleep is incredibly important just for the brain to be healthy. Mm. And it's even if you have Alzheimer's plaques in your brain, which naturally form with age as well, that's the stage of sleep where they're cleared out of your system. So brain clearance works yeah. best during that phase of sleep. And the problem is that it takes a little while to get to that phase. Mm -hmm. And the amount of time that you spend in deep sleep increases through the night. So during your first cycle, it's very short. During the second cycle, it's a little longer. In the middle of the night, it gets really long, but that's when so many women get the surges of cortisol and adrenaline, you're usually around two, three in the morning, and you wake up and you miss out on that part of your sleep that is so important for your health, but also the health of your brain. So we need to prioritize sleep. And I, I'm incredibly guilty. My sleep sucks. And so I'm not a good sleeper. I've never been. But I, I really try to protect my sleep as much as I can. And there are so many things that we can do to stay asleep longer like then the national sleep foundation provides very clear evidence mm -hmm. that women have a very hard time harder time than men falling asleep and staying asleep so, yeah 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 so we need to prioritize sleep and say i need to go to bed earlier nobody can talk to me no screen time for at least an hour before trying to get asleep and you need to have a certain amount of time that you're able to sleep because I personally don't have it. You know, by the time my husband is ready to go to sleep, it's like 11 midnight. I'm up at six. Mm -hmm. I don't get eight hours, even if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about this and trying to really make sure that I get to sleep. And I know so many women that also really have a hard time, also because of hormones, right? Perimenopause yeah. disrupts your list. It's, it's certainly one of, it's one of the main things I think people thank me for when they come back after they've started taking HRT is their sleeps come back. And um, when I was getting symptoms when, without realising what was going on, I was having night sweats, um, but then I was waking up in, at three, four in the morning without a night sweat, thinking, what's going on? I'm not depressed. I can't sleep. And then I would be thinking, I'm going to be tired tomorrow. This is ridiculous. And as part of yoga, I do do quite a lot of meditation, and I would really try hard to come back and clear my mind and rest my mind but it's really difficult and um sleep has is, is transformed i don't sleep really for, i probably have six seven hours most nights but i sleep really well i go to bed sleep and i wake up i shouldn't tell people because i'm sure there's lots of people listening that haven't got sleep but i know my whole it's my hormones because nothing else has changed and you know hormones must have an effect on the sleep part oh, of sure. my brain which is so important yeah, and in this case, is the estradiol and the progesterone, right? Yes. So there's this yeah. structure in the brain, it's called the brainstem, which is in charge of sleep and wake, and it's really full of estrogen receptors and progesterone yes. receptors. So the estrogen and the progesterone do not activate this brain region correctly because they're all over the place, then the brain cannot regulate sleep and wake correctly. And your melatonin goes down around 2, 3 in the morning, and cortisol picks up which is why we tend to wake up at that time of night. It's incredibly frustrating. Yes. Did you, I was reading that if you have low progesterone to start with and you tend to wake up more at night, taking um, low, like the lotion, the progesterone lotion, the progesterone creams yeah. with vitamin C seem to enhance the function of, of whatever it is that you're taking. So the vitamin C yeah, seems some, to have a good effect. Find that, some people find progesterone cream can take the edge off. The problem is with it, it's not licensed, it's not regulated. And if women are experiencing symptoms, perimenopausal symptoms, they usually need estrogen as well. So then they're better off having 17-beta estradiol through the skin, no risk of clot, 
and the micronized progesterone, which is the body identical progesterone, usually taken orally uh, because then it's regulated, it protects the lining right. of the wound, the effects of oestrogen. And then we, we recommend women take it at night on an empty stomach, and then it has this sedative effect for not all, but the majority of women find they just. It helps them sleep, which is such a lovely side effect. So, oh my goodness, for sure. And does it work better with the vitamin C? There are clinical um, trials showing that. I wonder. Yeah, a lot of people take vitamin C. Certainly now with COVID nineteen, there's there's many. <laughs> That's true. Know. So a lot of people do. So I don't know. We spend a lot of time talking about you know diet and nutrition as well, and um, it's. That it's the whole thing, isn't it? It's not just one thing that's going to help, and yeah. everyone's different. And um, we need to make sure that everyone has individualized advice, whether it's about dementia, whether it's about menopause, whether it's about their general health, because we're all different. Our genetic makeup is different. But yes. um, but I think um, we need to finish because it's nearly an hour. But I could talk to you all day. It's been absolutely brilliant, Lisa. And, for those of you that have enjoyed it, we are going to record a podcast as well, so I can yes. pick in your brains and talk about. Um, so it's it's been brilliant because I think this has just shared a lot of information that maybe a lot of people hadn't realised or known. So it, I'm really grateful to you, honestly, for sharing your time you. and having this discussion. It's been really good. So thank you ever so much. Thank you so much. I wish I could be there in person, but COVID one just day. cancelled all my one plans. Day. Yeah, one, one day. day. One day. Yeah. I love England. You know, I wanted to go to Cambridge in England for my PhD and they didn't let me. They sent me here. <laughs> oh, well, I love no England. Problem. I've been so many times. To New York as well, but there's, there's lots we can do. So, but um, I look forward to speaking to you soon. And thanks ever so much for everyone that's listened today. And I hope you've got a lot out of it. So, and thanks to Rebecca, Sarah and Zoe who have been typing away in the background. It's been really useful. So thank you. Right, thank thanks. you so much. All right. Bye. Bye.